I don't want people to think that's what menopause is. It's a time where, yes, your body's changing, but you went through that when you went through puberty. You just had your parents around you telling you you were crazy or trying to help navigate it. But now yeah. at the other end of things, <laughs> and you want to be empowered to make it a positive experience to get through it and change that narrative that menopause means you're aging out of a life because it's not. Mm -hmm. It's a new state of being and you can control what you're doing to keep progressing and get fitter and really enjoy quality of life. Hello and welcome to Pursuing Health. I'm Dr. Julie Fouché, family physician and former CrossFit Games athlete. Here, I bring you information and inspiration to help bridge the gap between fitness and medicine and support your journey toward your healthiest self. Thank you so much for joining me. Now let's get started with this week's episode. Hi there. I just wanted to give you a little heads up about the audio quality of this episode. Unfortunately, we had some issues with Stacy's audio that weren't caught until towards the end of our conversation. So I just wanted to apologize about that. And I really hope that you'll stick with us and listen because she had so much good knowledge to share but again, apologies for the quality of the audio in most of this episode. Welcome back to Pursuing Health. I am really excited to, to be here again with Dr. Stacy Sims, who is returning to the podcast. We last talked several years ago. It was back in December of 2020. So if you haven't heard that one, go back and check out episode 176. If you are not familiar with Stacy, she is a forward-thinking international exercise physiologist and nutrition scientist, and she is on a big mission, let me tell you, to revolutionize exercise, nutrition, and performance for women. She has a background doing lots of research herself and directing research programs for female athlete health and performance, and is really pushing the dogma to improve research for all women. You may have seen her TED Talk, Women Are Not Small Men. Um, and that tagline that I think just says a thousand words, um, in her first book roar, which helped challenge a lot of existing dogma for women in exercise and nutrition and health. And since our last conversation, she's released a second book called next level, which is on all things menopause. So I'm excited to dive in that into that more today. Um, she's currently in New Zealand where she is a research associate with Sprins AUT university. I'm not sure if I said that right. Um, but she, she uh, works there. Where she's supervising PhD students. She writes papers. And she's also on the advisory board of cutting edge companies you may have heard of, like Tonal, Wild AI, Whoop, Momentus, and Exos. And on top of that, she creates amazing online content. So if you want to learn more, you can check those out on her website, drstacysims.com. Um, and I think we're going to talk about some more content she's releasing today, which I'm excited about. So um, just doing all the things we just talked before we started recording that she's, you know, constantly feeling the pull of being a mom, all these great opportunities with work, and she's just juggling it all just like the rest of us. So thank you so much for joining me, Stacey. I feel tired after listening to you say all that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we feel tired just watching you from afar with everything that you're doing. It's really incredible. And it's incredible. The, um, I think the spotlight that women's performance, health, and research is starting to get in the mainstream because it has not always been that way. And a lot of it is because of all the work you've been doing. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. It's exciting to see what's happened in the past five years. Um, just, I think we reached a global tipping point where athletes were now vocal. And so then that yes. kind of this cascade where we're like, Oh yeah. Okay. We do need to talk about this stuff. So it's exciting. Yes. I think we are. And it's, I think it's a trend that we're seeing in general with, you know, people are taking their health into their own hands. And, you know, now this information is so much more widely accessible that we can do our own research. And we're not just accepting what we hear at the doctor's office, but we're asking more questions. And, you know, the information that you are putting out there and that you have been doing with your research for so many years is what we're all looking to. So it's really cool. Um, you know, I'm sure there's been times during your career where you're like, who's even reading this? Like, is the message getting out? And now it's finally out there. Yeah. Someday um, I feel like down here at the bottom of the world, but it's good to know that <laughs> there's an impact being made. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I do want to focus a lot on menopause, peri, menopause, menopause, because it is such an area that there is, you know, 
hit for so long has been stigmatized and not been talked about a lot. And there's a lot of confusing information for women. And you've really tackled this. You released your book, Next Level, but we'd love to start here. And I thought maybe we could start with like a, an example case study, because I see a lot of female patients who are of all, obviously of all different ages, but there's a, a common thread that I see where I have women who are maybe um, perimenopausal. So they're starting to have irregular cycles um, or, I mean, postmenopausal too, obviously, but they're busy, right? They're moms, they have busy careers. They have parents who are getting older. They're trying to do it all. They have been exercising for a long time. They're still exercising. They've tried every diet, right? They've tracked their macros. They've done everything out there, but they're still experiencing either a, a increased fatigue or a change in their exercise performance or some new belly fat that just won't go away. And it's really frustrating. <laughs> and so I'd love to hear, you know, to your, your perspective on this kind of stereotypical, obviously everybody's a little bit different, but a woman who's in a similar situation to this, what are some of the things that we should be thinking about? Well, when women are in this hairy to early to late perimenopause, so like by definition, that's around the 10 year before at one point in time called me. And then you have postmenopause. Just clear, clarifying for people who might not want to get mm-hmm. there. Yes, let's sure. get our definition straight. Yeah, yeah. So when we're looking at it, women are in a very highly driven sympathetic state. So they're tired but wired. And this is because when we start to see this hormone flux of estrogen progesterone with more and ovulatory cycles, so you're not producing as much progesterone, you might have times where you have more estrogen dominance or you have less estrogen than what your body's used to. It plays havoc in all the systems. Because we know that every system of the body is pretty much affected by estrogen and progesterone. So when we start looking from a physiological perspective of what's happening, we see that these two hormones are really critical for things like neurotransmitters, for mean mass development, for bone, for um, the glucose control, for insulin, and the response to exercise with regards to growth hormone films, um, testosterone, and cortisol. So if we continue to do the training that we've been doing for years, right? So we see mm-hmm. 45 to 60 minute but hit classes that aren't really hit, it's at moderate intensity, mm-hmm. or getting up super early and trying to do a, a session or so, right? We're putting our bodies squarely in this modern intensity, which is not beneficial. It does drive cortisol up. We don't have a, a subsequent response of growth hormone and testosterone, which drops cortisol. We aren't producing a stress that's hard enough to invoke change, nor is it easy enough to try to invoke parasympathetic response. Mm-hmm. So we're just continuously driving our body in a sympathetic state, which then signals this cascade effect of poor exercise performance, poor sleep, Increased body fat, increased insulin resistance, and women get to a point where they're like, "What the?" And so then they start trying to uh, moderate or cut calories. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the old school thinking that we've all grown up with: calories in, calories out, fat burning, all of those kind of terms, which are just marketing words. And we know that calories in and calories out is not a third rule, especially for this population. We have to look for fueling what we're doing. And we need to look at recovering from that so that we aren't invoking an increased sympathetic demand. So in our typical case study, which you outlined perfectly well, I try to, to have the woman lay out how does her day go, right? So if you get up and you are immediately straight into a session on black coffee or coffee with something and then mm-hmm. come home right into getting kids ready for school or getting ready for work and mm-hmm. you might have a movie, maybe you don't. And then you go through the day and you're really busy and you're not really focusing on what you need to eat. And then you get home, you're starving, so you have a glass of wine while you're trying to make dinner and then you eat too much of dinner and then you're still hungry after dinner, so you want a snack and then you try to get fed. And you know, it's this consistent It's a thing. runaway train, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And all of that contributes to exacerbating menopausal or perimenopausal symptoms. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
So I want to pick apart. I want to go through every step of that day so we can outline what might be a better scenario. But I think the the distinction that you make here is so important and so, um, you know, not well understood about this moderate intensity because, you know, a lot of my listeners are doing CrossFit. And I think that my sense is, is there's when you do those kinds of workouts, right? Like the 20 to 30 minute workout where you're just moving those tend to feel the best, right? Like, oh, I got a really good workout in because I was sweating and pushing myself for 20 to 30 minutes versus maybe a strength day where a lot of people like to skip those days or, you know, a lower intensity, like a jog or a slow row where, you know, oftentimes people end up speeding up because they think higher intensity is better. So um, I think that's a really important distinction to make that if we're always in, and the beautiful thing about CrossFit is there's a lot of variation, right? So you have your heavy days, you have your long so distance, you have these moderate intensity workouts, but it's a really important distinction to make because so often I think we as a community tend to lean towards the moderate intensity because it feels good. Or I've heard you talk about like programs like Orange Theory or F45, right? They are all in that kind of time range where it's, it's intensity, but it's not the high intensity or the like max high end strength that we're looking for to have the impact, the desired physiological impact, especially for perimenopause. Right. Exactly. And I got a question yesterday from a journalist who was like, well, there are all these influences in there saying we should be with high intensity because it drives cortisol on. I'm like, well, it's fine high intensity. If you're talking about these hit classes, then yeah, because we don't have the other half of the conversation. Well, if we look at true high-intensity interval training, which also includes sprint interval training, where you're having really short, sharp intervals with lots of recovery in your children, so you really are polarizing that workout, then we see there is an uh, increase in birth hormone, there is an increase in testosterone, and we feel some failure. Yes, there's an acute rise, but after two hours, it's completely down, lower than this one. And that's what we're after. But when you look at these for hit classes like you're describing, where it's 45 minutes and you feel like you're pushing yourself, but you're not really polarizing, you're not going as hard as you can, you're just kind of staying in this mm-hmm. 75, 80% zone, then it does raise cortisol and you don't have that growth hormone and testosterone response to bring it down. And that's where we're starting to see all these problems. So when I'm talking to someone about trying to you really have to take ownership of it and you have to really polarize it. Where I have so many people who love CrossFit, and I think that's great. But you're right. They skip on the strength because they don't feel like they're getting a really good work for that. It's like, well, actually, strength is cornerstone, especially now, because we need to find a central nervous system response to stimulate our body to build and keep a new mass. Because mm-hmm. estrogen is a working person. So if you're skipping the strength days, then you might as well skip the gym. Because if you're not really working to build that in the mass, and then you go to the Metcon, all you're doing is turn into into your in the mass because the Metcons in the way that it's designed in the class, for the most part, isn't really putting you up in that super high intensity with enough recovery. Because if you see an AMRAMP or you see every minute on the minute, that's putting you in that 20 to 30 minutes of modern intensity. It's not true with high intensity with recovery. So I tell people, look, you need to take ownership of it. And if it's a heavy day, you go and you do the heavy lifting and then you're just moving in that arm. Mm-hmm. If it's a true high intensity day and you look at the workout, you go, okay, it's, a, it's an EMOM. I'm going to work really hard for 30 to 40 seconds and then recover before I get to the next one. And that's mm-hmm. what you need to do. You don't try to work all the way to 55 seconds and then five seconds turn around and get into the next. Uh, <laughs> right, excellent. right. So when you start explaining it, people are like, oh, okay. And then all of a sudden they feel the difference. Mm-hmm. Oh, I mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that it makes me think of too. So many times I think people are unsatisfied when it's just a heavy day, right? When the whole workout is just lifting and they feel like they need to have a lift and a Metcon to get a good workout when actually that could be doing harm to us if we're doing every day and we're really burning out our, our sympathetic system. So yeah. I think that's great. And doing these workouts as they're intended, right? Like not trying to push scaling them appropriately so that you're doing the EMOMs in the intended time interval. I think that's great. What are, so can you outline for us, like what does a true high intensity workout look like? And what are we looking for when you're saying a strength workout? Yeah. So um, 
I love pure strength things because you're going and like, oh, okay, I feel worked, but I don't feel like exhausted. And this yeah. is because from that long endurance background where every workout you feel completely worked and exhausted. <laughs> so yeah. we're looking at like a pure strength thing. Um, we're looking at that that typical five by five where you're getting you're working up and building up to the last three sets at five or eighty percent or more running. And then that might just be deadlifts, might be squats. And then in between, you're sitting down and recovering, right? So mm-hmm. you're absolutely recovering. And then you might have some more accessory type work after that. So maybe you're doing some single leg, no minimum deadlifts, but you're, you're not doing any more than six reps of that. And you're really focusing on form and technique to kind of help stimulate the first really heavy work that you do. And then you sit down and you cover between the two of those. And then we've got to invest. Like, yep, yeah, that doesn't sound a lot, but it's so taxing on the central nervous system. And you need that. You need that to get that lean mass development and to get the adaptation. If we're talking about a true high intensity day. There's two ways to look at it. We have the subset of sprint and movement, which doesn't mean running sprints. It just means full gas at 30 seconds or less, usually five to 30 seconds. So you're hitting an RPE of 9 or 10. You can't rely on heart rate because heart rate lags too much to hit that. Mm-hmm. You're looking at an RPE of 9 or 10 for 5 to 30 seconds. And then recovery between that is full recovery. So it could be two minutes, it could be three minutes, but don't cut the recovery short because you're going to do the next interval just as hard because that's mm-hmm. true. How hard can I go with each one? And you might only do four or five. When you're first starting, maybe only two before you're completely past that. If we're looking at high intensity interval training, the interval is longer and the intensity is a little bit less. So you're hitting about 80% of max, VO2 max, or we're looking at a, around an eight on the RPE scale. And it might be a minute to four minutes, depending on what we're given. So this could be a row, could be a salt bike. You know, so you're going as hard as you can for a minute, and then you have two to to three minutes off. So you're having more metabolic recovery. So then you can hit the next interval again. One of the workouts that I really love that really fits in here is you have a buy-in of like 10 mm-hmm. deadlifts at 75%. Then you get on the assault bike or the rower and you try to accumulate as many meters as you can for the remainder of that minute. And then you have a full minute off and then you mm-hmm. do it again. You might do five or six of those. Mm-hmm. So that's through high intensity because you're getting everything revved up by the buy-in and you get on those far as you can for the remainder of the minute and you have to yep. pull it out. Yeah. I love that. That's a, that in my mind, I call that a Chris Hinshaw style workout. I don't know if you've ever met Chris Hinshaw, but he writes a lot of workouts like that and they're very effective. Yeah. Super um, effective. That's great. And then how would you plan this out over the course of the week for someone who's in, you know, perimenopause, um, what, how much of this do they need? And is it, let's say you love the moderate intensity, you feel really good and you want to do those a little bit, like what is, what is appropriate? Um, so we really try to focus on dropping volume. So total duration of everything and focus on quality. So I tell people if they're already active and they're doing CrossFit kind of stuff, right. And so you're used to getting to the goal. So we look at minimum three days of heavy strength days. Mm-hmm. Uh, one to two days of true high intensity work and one day of sprint interval. So you might back up one of your heavy liftings with some sprints. Maybe you're, uh, you do your, your squats, and heavy squats, and then follow mm-hmm. up with some box jumps. Because the box jumps is still at high intensity work and it's still mm-hmm. considered sprint interval training. Um, but you're also doing some plyometric work in there. And that's another thing. I'm do. So that's done and dusted within 40 minutes, right? And then if you really love the modern intensity stuff, we call it your soul food, then maybe you're doing one every seven to 10 minutes. So you're really looking forward to it and we're like making it more of a social thing rather than Mm -hmm. being Mm -hmm. focusing on that quality work. And then you have some soul food, another week of quality work, and then deload because people often forget about the deload. And it's that's very important. important. Super so important. Because we start looking at how our body recovers, and we see that we need a little bit more recovery 
one, because we're doing the polarized training, but two, as we get older, we need more true recovery. So it's mm-hmm. two weeks on of quality work, one with the beating. And then two weeks on of quality work, one with the beating. And you can play around with those two weeks. What are you going to focus on? Do you want to focus on building up squats and deadlifts? Do you want to focus on building the top and the aerobic work? So you can build blocks in those two weeks, but that deload week is all about mobility, really super low intensity type work to get that true full central nervous system and um, metabolic. That is big. So you're telling me every three weeks we need a full deload in terms of stretching, mobility, walking very low intensity, meaning no, you know, no, no high intensity. I think this is a, this is a big point because so many people to even take one week like that a year is a big deal. And so hearing that it, where you could have benefits from doing that every three weeks, that's big. It is. And when people first start it, they freak out because they're like, oh my gosh, I'm scared, you know, I'm sleep well. But then mm-hmm. they realize by day three or four, the people that week, they're in a deep sleep. They aren't like freaking out. They're not having all this anxiety and immediate uh, responses to stress because their body's like, yeah, I'm accumulating, I'm adapting, I'm feeling good. So when they go back to the quality work, they can really polarize. Because what happens is people are like, oh, look, the gym is open and they're open Monday through Saturday. I'm going to go to the class every day. Yeah. I want to miss out. I'm going to have FOMO. <laughs> yeah. And because the workouts are so varied, people don't think that the rules are the same thing they're going to That's big. Now, how about the infamous zone two that's getting so much <laughs> attention? Um, how, how do we think about that for our perimenopausal women? All the data out there on that too was based on men. Mm-hmm. Well, I've written quite a few articles on this recently because it's very frustrating with all of these people. Like, do I have to do zone two? I'm like, no. Women's muscle more quality is completely different. And we handle lactate different levels. If anything, we need to be doing more of that high intensity because we need to produce lactate. We need our brain to recognize lactate and be able to use it to attenuate all time and emotions. Because when we start looking at brain metabolism, when we start looking at the plaque buildup, that's the uh, precursor for Alzheimer's, it's a misstep of the glial understanding what lactate is. So why I'm saying that is because women have more what we call oxidative fibers. So they're type one, really slow aerobic type fibers. And we're really fantastic at using free fatty acids. We have better mitochondria and mitochondrial respiration, mitochondrial health in men just by the nature of being a cis woman. And when you start doing zone two, it doesn't do anything. It feels good if you do it properly and you really mm-hmm. love tips. It's so it's good for recovery day. But we may not have to spend all of that time in zone two to let them go from because it doesn't actually invoke an rapid change at the best mm-hmm. So when we talk about zone two and perimenopause, if you're going to do zone two, you use it in the cell group and make sure that it is truly down to super, super easy. And we use that in the deload week, we look at it as being full recovery, but it's not an emphasis because mm-hmm. we are already adapted by being XX to go slow, to go long, to be very aerobic. What we don't have and what we lose quickly is the glycolytic or that anaerobic capacity. And that is so important to maintain for longevity and health, especially brain. So when I see women who are bypassing the true high intensity for zone two, I'm like, wait a second. No, 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 no. So this is why I'm getting frustrated with the influencers now as I'm going through high intensity. Like, mm-hmm. Well, why? Because if you're doing that zone two stuff, it's not causing an adaptive change. It's not going to help with body composition. It's not going to help with brain health. So yeah, we just really need to take a step back and say, where did this data originate? It originally from primarily male elite cyclists that in our, um, were being looked at for lactate production and the lactate metabolism and how do we increase our ability to be burn free fatty acids. So then, like everything, we got brought into the health world and it's like, I'm still sure no, It's male data and we're completely different these things. Mm-hmm. I think that's so important because. These these things just take off, especially with social media these days. And it's so important to question, right? Where is 
the data coming from that these recommendations are being made from? And even, I mean, any rec- any recommendations, right? Because all the most of the data is from men wherever we look, but um, such an important area to, to focus on. That's amazing. Now, how does this change as a woman shifts to a me- like post-menopausal, if at all? So the biggest instigation of body consciousness and change is really about the five years before that one thing of time. So if we're invoking all these different changes in our training and nutrition before that, when we get into post-menopausal disorder, we have early postmenopause, so those are about the eight years after menopause, where we really need to focus on the same things that we did with perimenopause. So we're looking at high intensity work, we're looking at um, heavy lifting, looking at increasing our gut microbiome diversity, all of those things that are going to help with our symptomology and body composition change. When we get to late perimenopause, so that's eight plus years postmenopause. We see that we need more frequent doses and less volume. So this mm-hmm. means instead of going and doing five to eight intervals, we're doing maybe four, but we're doing more frequent. Instead of two to three times a week, we're doing four to five times a week. Mm-hmm. So it's very short, sharp doses. And we need that because now we are completely flattened. We don't have any kind of estrogen receptor. It's not doing anything. So for vascular compliance, so our ability to vasodilating the strip for blood pressure, for um, metabolic control, insulin resistance, all of those things. And then we could put the body more frequently with that high intensity work and strength training across the board. If you have to choose between one or the other, strength training. Because we're seeing that heavy resistance, even women who are 70, 80 years old are being um, put in RCTs and looking at the difference between the 10 to 12 reps and a higher mm-hmm. intensity. And the uh, heavier lifting is working better for the moments and the so when we're looking at that late postmenopause strength training with more frequent doses of that time intensity work is what we need. Love it. Now going back to this this day that you laid out for our perimenopausal women. So you know, you said maybe black coffee and getting the workout in early before the kids get up and go off to school. When would be the ideal time? Obviously, we don't always get ideal because life is messy, but when would be the ideal time to be doing these workouts and how would the morning look differently to best support our nervous system? Um, so really, it's about looking backwards and you're getting enough sleep. So if you do have to deal up for the at that time, we're not compromising the sleep. To say someone needs to get up at five, get up at the world and somewhere at 5 30, 6 o'clock, known by the 7, 7 15. It's not black coffee. You're having some food before you get. And it doesn't have to be a dry meal. You're looking at 30 grams of carb, 15 grams of protein. So maybe you're having a piece of sprouted grain toast and some you know, Or maybe you're having a uh, protein fortified full food pattern. So you're having some carbohydrate, you're having some protein. You go, you do your workout, and you're taking the ownership of that workout. Is it strength? Is it high intensity? And then when we get home, within 30 to 45 minutes, you're having a real meal. So if you're on the go and you need to do a smoothie or something like that, make sure that it's it's rich with protein and fruit. Sometimes we look at frozen cauliflower because it gives the same mouthfeel as banana. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. We will sneaking that in. We get everything out the door, right? And ready to go. So you book in the your workout with good adequate nutrition so that the hypothalamus is going, yeah, okay, I've got exposed food coming in, can handle the stress. I've stopped that breakdown effect. So I'm not going to tune through my own math. But then the rest of the day you gotta make sure that you're eating. You're having protein at every meal. You make sure that you're having that snack around through the four so that when you get home you're not starving. And it gives you a better insight, better energy. So if we look at how we're uh, only scoping our food, we want to eat for the stress of living. So you're having something before and after you work out. You're having something mid-morning because you're starting to have an energy dip. Then you have your lunch. Then you have some kind of afternoon snack. And then you have dinner and you stop eating. So when we're looking at how we... So we're working with our final biology. We're working with the stress in the day. And it then feeds to better sleep. 
the total bed of sleep, you have a sense of drive, and the need better reparation, and the need for stay, you feel better, and you keep progressing forward. I love that. And what a difference. I think sometimes we just underestimate the impact that those changes can make, like how different we can feel if we shift our nutrition in that direction. Um, and, and we, you know, sometimes we just, we tend to think that the answer has to be something more complicated, but sometimes it's very simple, and um, so, simple, but not always easy. <laughs> simplicity never wins again, because it's one, it's not easy, but two, people are like, really, it's that simple. Why do I not not have to pay a lot of money for it, right? Right, right. Yeah. Um, What other specific things should women, perimenopausal women, be thinking about for nutrition, like specifically around protein? And I know the gut microbiome is very helpful. How can we nurture that? Yeah, so uh, one of the things that's coming out, which is invoking a lot of the um, increase in cereal fat and abdominal and possibly body composition challenge, is a decrease in the diversity of their gut Mm microbiome. So part of it is the um, second bypass of our sex hormone metabolism. So for people who are listening, that means, you know, initially our bodies release estrogen and progesterone, but it doesn't end there. Also goes to the liver, and the liver, you know, bind them up with sex hormone binding block globulin. That is excreted in bile into the gut. And then we've got bugs on conjugate or take it away from the sex hormone binding block globulin and shoot it back out in the circulation. So when we start having a misstep in our sex hormones, we start losing those gut bugs. And unfortunately, what happens is we an overgrowth of the more obesogenic type because we're in the sympathetic drive. We start craving more carbohydrates. So we start eating a little bit more processed carbohydrates, not consciously, but you know, or maybe we're under eating and so we have a good hold. So we start really getting this more um, dysbiosis. So if we're looking at eating more fibrous fruit and veg, it helps keep that diversity. So that's what we're at. We talk about protein as we get older, especially the protein files, because we don't age in linear fashion. We need to have more protein post-exercise because we are more anabolically resistant both to exercise and to protein. So we're looking at around that 40 grams post-exercise and having 30 to 40 grams of that tumor because we want to have these regular doses of protein throughout the day, for the neurotransmitter health, for the lean mass development, and for other functions. Um, and so people are like, oh, that's a lot of protein. So it's, it sounds that way, but when you start to look at how do I get all that protein, it's not just normal products. Like we look at using sprouted grains, we look at the nuts and the seeds and contributing that to the fruit and veg. And then you have a wide variety of things that are fit, and that's good. Love that. How about supplements? I know you've shared a lot on the research behind creatine. So I'd love to hear more on that and why that can be so helpful for women and what we've learned about it beyond, you know, where it, where it gets most of its claim to fame for, for athletes, um, and bodybuilders, and then any other supplements that you think are really important for women in this time period. Creatine I love because it's gotten so many servants and you know, again, it used to be for bodybuilding. So we hear all the side effects of bloating. I don't want to move because I don't want to get bloated. But when we're looking at creatine specifically, women have around 70 to 80% of the stores going. And we need it for muscle function, but also for heart, gut, and brain. So if we're looking at supplementing maybe three to five grams a day only, so it's not massive bloating, but just that, that small amount, over the course of four to four weeks, be fully softer. So from that means that our muscles work better, our gut works better, we have um, better brain metabolism. And we also see in things like, uh, especially problem with like anxiety and depression, by supplementing with creatine, we end up getting out of those depressive and anxious situations in that. So, so we don't have to rely so much on, on serotonin or the fitting things. So when we're looking at pre-term for health, super important. When we're looking at the side effects that people talk about, it depends on the kind of pre-term that we're actually using. We want to aim for um, supplements that aren't companies that use pre-term because the process of that doesn't use an asset. 
So if we're looking at how we're structuring and building like the team as a supplement, there's a couple of different methods. We're looking at the cheaper version, it often is um, we find to be in the acid and the acid wash. And this mm -hmm. is what we're doing with the study. Because it's not a pure, you end up ingesting a lot more of the acid than you do the creatine. But Free Cure is a German company, and I think they supply most of the high end supplements anyway. And they use a process that doesn't use an acid. So the same, the instantized Free Cure doesn't cause a side. Full disclosure, I have nothing to do. I just said the word. So creatine is super important. When we look at other supplements, you can go down the whole route of adaptogens that help individuals with different perimenopausal symptoms. And some of the top ones have been highly researched. You can go on the NIH Quantum Monthly Alternative Medicine website. You can go to uh, the Mayo Clinic, and they have a whole like list of what these adaptogens are. So ashwagandha is one. Um, Rhodiola is another. Those are two very effective mm -hmm. ones for being stress and sleep issues. And then the other one is vitamin D. You mm -hmm. see that so many women, even if they live in sunny places in the middle of summer, the vitamin D function. So they're on the low end of the room where the vitamin D. And because we're sunscreening or covering up, we're not producing it, or we're not producing as much. And then we're inside a lot in the winter, and we just don't have it. And we start seeing low vitamin D, we have a misstep in our man, and we have a misstep in muscle product, uh, muscle recovery, and we end up with more fatigue. So just really get your eye on the chat. With regards to all the other supplements, there's not a lot of research to show that which one. Mm -hmm. The one that I get uh, a little bit, my hackles go up a little bit, is the uh, beet juice and nitrates. Mm -hmm. it's used a lot like vasodilator and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And pre and perimenopausal women, it is not going to function because you still have estrogen. And estrogen is tightly tied to the way our blood vessels function. It's tightly tied to the nitric acid side. When we get to post menopause, nitrates work. So we have lots of estrogen factor. So when we're looking at how do we use nitrates, if we're looking to attenuate hot flashes or you know, increasing our food tolerance before a hot workout, use nitrates with your post menopausal. But don't if you're pre menopausal or perimenopausal. You might want to look at using some not added alanine, which is also very beneficial with a dilator, but it, it doesn't work in the same systems. So those are the big overviews of the supplements we know that have research going on. The rest of them, not so much. We know that isn't good. And it doesn't mean that they're, you know, there may, may be ones that are helpful. We just don't have a lot of research on them yet, right? Right. And then it is also individual, right? So you have people who are not using the news that are not being used. Yeah. But all that is more of an individual basis rather than like the general. Right. Things that are, right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I also wanted to talk about fasting because I know this is something that you talk about a lot and where there's been a lot of research in men and men and women are very different in terms of how they respond to fasting. And, and we talked about this in the last podcast with mm -hmm. regard to women who are having menstrual cycles, but, um, how does the, how do you think about fasting for women who are in peri or even postmenopausal? Yes. There's another one where we have to look at terminology. So if we're talking about intermittent fasting and we're talking about like the alternate day fasting, we're talking about 16 hours, all the long fasts, mm -hmm. still not appropriate for women. It drives that sympathetic system up. It doesn't invoke a parasympathetic change. Uh, part of it is about telomere length and and your the health and longevity aspects. But again, we're not seeing a lot of efficacy for women in that. What we are seeing good outcomes for both men and women is time-restricted eating, where mm -hmm. you're eating breakfast, you're breaking your fast by 8 a.m., and then you're not eating after dinner because we're mm -hmm. looking at population research in both men and women. And we see that if you are holding your fast till noon, that you end up with more obesogenic outcomes. You don't have any kind of improvement in metabolic health. You don't have weight loss. If you do, it's all lean mass loss. We don't want to lose that. And it doesn't help with parasympathetics activation. 
So regardless of man or woman, you want to work chronobiology. So that's that time-restricted eating. So people call it fasting, I call it normal eating, where you eat <laughs> breakfast and then you don't eat after dinner. So that works effectively. This also takes away that whole idea of training fasted, except for mm -hmm. our scenario where a woman's getting up at 5.30 and having food before, you're breaking your fast earlier. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you really want that 12-hour overnight time-restricted eating, then maybe you're having dinner earlier. So you got to work that system if you're really invested in that. But the biggest thing across the board is really making sure you have at least two hours before you go to bed where you haven't had any food, because that is the biggest impact on sleep. And sleep is so variable when you're peri and postmenopausal that you really have to look after that. So, you know, how that fits in your time restricted eating, that's up to the individual. What time do you get up? What time do you go to bed? But overall, big, long fast, not, not any evidence to show that it's beneficial for women. I'm curious about your thoughts on periodic fasting. So not on a consistent basis, but say a woman were to do a longer fast, or maybe you've seen like a fasting mimicking diet, but it's something they do once or twice a year for longevity benefits. Is that something, especially I guess if they're cycling and they time it during, you know, certain phases of their cycle, is that something that you think could be beneficial or do we have research on that? We look at the longevity stuff, right? So we're looking at family length, we're looking at um, neural growth patterns, we're looking at body composition, we're looking at all of these things. We look to strength training. Mm -hmm. Because when we're looking at strength training and the research that's coming up now in women about strength training, especially longevity, we see that it's so important for that strength training that it supersedes the fasting. So if we're looking at, um, you know, telomere length changes, neural growth patterns, it's consistent resistance training. When we look at the fasting mimicking diet and times where you're like, okay, I'm going to withhold so that I can get some longevity benefits. It's short lived for the most part. And if we're looking at not a training block, but actually for the ability to move through life. So when we're 90, mm -hmm. we can still walk with groceries. Mm -hmm. Fasting is not going to do much. Mm -hmm. When we're looking at eliminating processed foods as much as possible, especially ultra processed and we're looking at taking care of our gut microbiome, which becomes a little bit, you get a little bit of dysbiosis when you withhold food, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to really- microbiome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you're looking at the gut microbiome and how changeable it is, it's really important not to have a lot of dysfunctional eating when we talk about it that way. And then exercise, like aerobic exercise is a stronger longevity aspect than fasting. And I think the way fasting has come about from like Victor Longo and mm -hmm. those guys is it originated on rats and they haven't really mm -hmm. transferred it to looking at females, humans, because the rats humans were men, <laughs> men in the small trials were men, no women. And it just blew up. It just mm -hmm. blew up. Right. Mm -hmm. And the really, if we bring it back to eating normally, eating clean, all of the things that we want to do and we hear about then that's going to give you longevity, not these intermittent parts of fasting and having days where you're increasing your sympathetic drive. Mm -hmm. And it just doesn't fit well with what we know from chronobiology and longevity. Mm -hmm. I think that helps to put it in perspective with, you know, what, what are the things that are most important? It's those consistent things that you do every day. Um, and you can't out outsmart those with, you know, some of, some of the hacks that are out there. So yeah. You know, always bring it back to what is going to preserve lean mass? Because mm -hmm. it is so incredibly difficult to build lean mass and maintain it, especially as you get older, both as a man and a woman. So if you have four days of fasting, mimicking low calorie, or you have long times of fast, the very first thing to go is lean mass. Mm -hmm. We're seeing that with those impact, you know, we're getting all the data mm -hmm. on those impact is rapid weight loss, but it's lean mass. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a huge worry to me as a physiologist and someone who's in the active space, because I know how hard it is to build. And when people are losing it, I think about, you know, in five, 10 years, when this whole population of Ozempic users are now sarcopenic 
and mm-hmm. unable to do anything in the drain on the public health care system. Right? So there is no quick fix. We have to put in the work. We change the kind of work we're doing throughout our life, but mm-hmm. you have to put in the work. Mm-hmm. Speaking of um, trends and hacks, I'd love to hear you touch on cold therapy as well, because this is one that's getting a lot of attention now. And again, is based off of a lot of research on men. Yes, exactly. So we look at cold versus hot, right? And we see cold therapy and cold um, water immersion ice baths. Uh, the ice and the cold is way too cold for women. We have a different threshold for constriction and shivering. So we look at around 16 degrees Celsius water. So that's around 58, which isn't ice. And then we'll have a vagal response. So we'll have that whole like initial shock body mm-hmm. adapts to that. And then you can get some more parasympathetic. But that's about where cold water works for women. We go to the other end and we're looking at um, sauna and sauna exposure, not infrared, but true, where you're building the heat Mm -hmm. from internal, not skin, having changes in heat shock protein. We're having changes in protein and, and DNA coupling, uncoupling. We're seeing improvements in cardiovascular health. We're seeing improvements in thermoregulation. So all the benefits that we want for extremities of temperature come from heat for women rather than cold. If you're someone who who, um, needs to get used to cold water for some kind of event, then yes, there's definitely time and a place for using it. But if we're looking for the ability to improve our cardiovascular, parasympathetic, our metabolic control, and you want to use extremes, go with heat exposure. It's much more effective in women. Got it. And more like thinking about this as a a huge stressor on our system, right? And so it's one of those things where more is not always better. And um, just being judicious if you are using it about how and, and, and asking yourself why, for what purpose, and is it really giving you that intended benefit? Okay. Okay. Last question on perimenopausal women and then anything else I missed, but anything else we should be thinking about as far as recovery, other than obviously we need sleep and that becomes harder and this deload week every three weeks. We're seeing a lot of soft tissue injury and joint issues. So mobility is super, super important. So maintaining range of motion, Looking after impacts as well. So if you're starting to have a lot of joint aches and you're, you know, strengthening around the joints, maybe mm-hmm. you're having a day where you're having more joint flare ups, so you're not going to push or box jumps or some kind of impact. But at the same time, knowing that if you were doing some kind of jump training a couple of days a week, that's going to help with bone density. So mm-hmm. it's just really managing and knowing that soft t- tissue injuries are very, very common because you're having changes in estrogen. So be proactive in mobility, be proactive in keeping that soft tissue very pliant, super important. And the one thing that we haven't touched on is menopause hormone therapy. And I know Mm -hmm. that that's a huge question out there. Like, should Mm -hmm. I go on menopause hormone therapy? If you listen to someone like Peter Atia, he thinks every woman should be on menopause hormone therapy. I'm like, that's a disservice. That's like telling every woman they need to be on an oral contraceptive pill. We look at. (laughs) Menopause hormone therapy, it's a tool in the toolbox, right? Mm -hmm. So we talk about all the tools. We have diet changes. We have exercise changes. We have sleep hygiene. We have adaptogens. We have non-hormonal pharmacological things that can help with vasomotor symptoms. Menopause hormone therapy is there. But what it doesn't do is doesn't stop the changes. It doesn't Mm -hmm. stop lean mass loss. It'll slow the rate of change but you still have to put the work in. And when we're talking about it, if you have severe rage and mood issues, definitely helpful. Severe vasomotor symptoms, definitely helpful. There's no evidence that it helps with osteoarthritis, doesn't help with joint pain, doesn't help with soft tissue injuries. So the conversation around menopause hormone therapy stems from the fact that everyone thinks that this is a deficiency in your Mm -hmm. estrogen and progesterone, but it's not a deficiency. It's a withdrawal. Just like puberty is the onset of this, we're on the other end of things and it's a natural process of aging. So we're Mm -hmm. not trying to replace our hormones. We're not trying to build them up to a point where they used to be. We're looking at using menopause hormone therapy if it is needed 
as a way to attenuate the changes, get through this by maintaining a quality of life. Mm-hmm. So I get questions on it all the time and you didn't answer or ask it. So I had to put it out there. You had to put it out there. Yes, absolutely. It's an, it's such an important topic and question. And it's, and it's so true. It's so individual and it is not a panacea for every, mm-hmm. you know, every change that you're experiencing in, in perimenopause. So, or menopause. Um, okay. Anything else you think is important for questions that you get a lot important for women in this phase of life? Uh, people get overwhelmed when they say, whoa, all these are changes and I have to do all these changes. It's like, let's yeah. just start with one at a time. Because mm-hmm. again, we're not looking at this as a training block of life. We're not looking at this as a one year massive invoked change, a training block. We're looking at what things we're putting into play to have longevity for the rest of our life. Because this is the transition into a new biological state. So if we start putting these into play, when we're starting in our you know, like our mid forties and putting mm-hmm. these things into play, it really does change the way your body responds to perimenopause, where you're not mm-hmm. going to necessarily put on all the weight because people are so afraid of putting on all the weight. Mm-hmm. If we're putting in the polarized training and the strength training, then you're going to slow that rate of change. Taking care of the gut microbiome, you might not have any body composition change. So it's all about being proactive, so that when you hit postmenopause. You're not all of a sudden looking at a brand new body you don't understand and going, what happened? These are tools to empower you to be able to get through it and accept it and have a positive experience. Because from a social standpoint, we've all been told to dread menopause. Like you look at mass media, you look at all the popular TV programs, you don't really see women over the age of 40. If so, they're like the golden girls, right? Where they're all... (laughs) Who actually those actresses playing Golden Girls were only in their 50s, right? So you're thinking <laughs> about what? And so I don't want people to think that's what menopause is. It's a time where, yes, your body's changing, but you went through that when you went through puberty. You just had your parents around you telling you you were crazy or trying to help navigate it. But now yeah. at the other end of things, <laughs> and you want to be empowered to make it a positive experience to get through it and change that narrative that menopause means you're aging out of a life. Because it's not. Mm-hmm. It's a new state of being and you can control what you're doing to keep progressing and get fitter and really enjoy a quality of life. I love that. And yes, being, you know, so many of the things we talked about are really beneficial at any age, like you said, like, yeah, yeah. when it comes to nutrition, when it comes to being mindful of recovery and our sympathetic state, all, all of those things. So I love that. Now I have to touch on because I know you announced or Catherine and Annie announced just recently a program that you're doing with them for women. And I'd love for you to share just a little bit about how that came about and, you know, what people can look forward to in that. So we're launching in summer and it stems from Annie's experience with her mom in lockdown. Mm -hmm. So she, both of her parents wanted to get fit and they had the gym capabilities. So she was training both of her parents the way that, you know, she thought was appropriate with yeah. all the different Metcon and strength and stuff. Her dad wasn't as diligent, but still got all these fitness gains. Her mm-hmm. mom was on point. Nothing changed. Mm-hmm. And she was like, what? My mom put in all this work and I feel so awful. And then she mm-hmm. took our menopause course, learned about it, implemented all these changes. Her mom now got super fit. And she's like, we need this Amazing. for everyone. I was like, yeah, <laughs> we need something that's accessible where people understand what menopause is or perimenopause and what to do about it. So Mm -hmm. our first thing that we're launching is a six week kind of intro where Mm -hmm. we have the education around what is perimenopause, what is menopause, what's happening, why we need to change things, and then the workouts and nutrition information to go with it. So Annie and Katrin are designing the workouts, taking you through like they're actually Mm -hmm. in the room with you. And mm-hmm. I'm providing the education of why we need to do these things. That is amazing. What an incredible resource. I'm excited to, to share excited. that. <laughs> That's going to be awesome. Yes. And so needed, like you said. Um, sometimes we need that, that we need to understand well, all the time. We need to understand the why, right? To really buy in, especially if it's yeah. something that is unfamiliar or different than what we're used to. So I love that. I also wanted to touch on um, just what's happening with women's research in general. I know I saw some buzz back in like the fall and winter on a new 
um, White House Women's Health Research Initiative. And I know you had made a visit and had helped to, you know, share, you know, your knowledge on the state of the research and why this is important. But can you share with us more about that initiative and what it really means for research? I mean, I'm fighting for so long to get adequate funding and acknowledgement for women's research in all biomedical sciences. Mm -hmm. Sports science is this very tiny, tiny, tiny amount. But we're looking from everything from chemotherapy to uh, um, oral contraceptive pills, IUDs, everything that has to do with women's health. And it stems from a lot of our tactical athletes because our tactical athletes have to be mission ready regardless of what happens, right? Mm -hmm. And we have circadian rhythm changes, we have menstrual cycle, we have fertility, all of these things. So we've really been hodgepodging or putting things in research together to understand it. And it's a completely different population. So when the U.S. government says, hey, we have a hard time recruiting men into the military because they're not fit enough. We need to really tap into the women. We are like, well, wait a second. You can't tap into the women unless you take care of them. Mm -hmm. So that was like the big presentation we went to um, Congress. And it's like, look, if you really want to access this other population and take care of them, you really have to instigate change. We've mm -hmm. been doing it in the background and we've been really pushing. And we see medical research now with COVID coming like one benefit of COVID is it really made people sit up and take aware that there are sex differences in medical management and especially in something that's new like that. So like, mm -hmm. oh, we need more research in women. Yes, we do. Not just femtech. So we went, we presented, we said, look, here's the state of the affairs. Women are so far back. Why is it in 2023, we are just understanding that taking an oral contraceptive pill can mitigate brain structural changes that are reversible in adults, but not maybe not in young young kids. Yet a physician mm -hmm. is prescribing OCs all the time. Like that is not right. We look at our tactical athletes. You're telling them they have to do all this stuff, but yet you're not allowing them to have iron checks. You're not allowing them to have like female focused medical. You're not allowing them to have an IUD. None of this is allowable, but yet you want them to be mission ready. You want to look at all the um, ambient and the chemotherapies and all these kinds of things and just really push it over to women, but that's not appropriate either. So you need to step up. You need to give funding out. Mm -hmm. And then two weeks later, we got the announcement from Jill Biden's office of this new women's initiative where they're going to allocate, I think it's something like 20% of the DOD funding to wow. female athlete initiatives because 20% of all forces are women. So they're really stepping okay. up. How that plays forward, I don't know. I haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm looking for the I'll keep our fingers crossed. Yes. Yeah. I'm looking for all the the, you know, the come together government industry. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm looking right. for all. But the promise of funding and money is there. And mm -hmm. there is a whole bunch of new generation of female scientists who want to do research in this area. And all of us who are the older generation who still want to do research in this area, and we're like, show us the money because we have all these research projects planned and mm -hmm. we need to get them done to get them out there. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. It sounds like a big step in the right direction. And yes, um, hopefully there's more uh, that continues to flow. So that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, speaking of, you know, preparing ourselves for each next phase of life, um, I know you're also working on a youth course that's coming out soon. And I am so excited because I think there are so many of us that are just learning. I mean, after me being, you know, going through medical school, it wasn't until after medical school that I learned a lot of these things about um, the impact of my hormones on my health. And you know, using my cycle as a way to track my health. These are things that are not taught to us traditionally, um, whether it's in school or um, even in medical school. And so thinking about the impact that empowering girls with this information is just huge of how we can start to work with our bodies earlier and prepare ourselves for each next phase of life. So we'd love to hear a little bit about that course and what we can expect. Yeah. Um, so. You know, my daughter's 11 now and going through all this stuff and <laughs> been giving talks at different high schools across the years. And the conversation of menstrual cycle always comes up, but it's beyond that. Mm -hmm. We have to look at the early changes in how we're training our girls, right? So we hear in the news about all the increased incidences of ACL tears mm -hmm. and bone stress reactions. 
And when we're looking at puberty and what's happening is we have so many biomechanical changes that happen with girls, as well as changes in things like where center of gravity goes from Mm -hmm. upper body to lower body down into the center. But yet we're not taking that on board in modifying training, especially in sport, right? Mm -hmm. So girls aren't getting the retraining of how to jump, how to throw, how to run how to feel more comfortable in their changing body, right? So the whole youth course is designed to explain what's happening. Mm -hmm. How do we encourage our girls to do more functional training? So if we're looking at functional training, Kelly Sturridge just put up a couple of really cool things of like you're squatting to a box. Why? Because you want to learn that mechanic. Do we put a bar Mm -hmm. on? Sure, that can be load, but we're not looking at heavy strength training. We're looking at how the body is moving teaching the girls how to do that to prevent injury, to give them more empowerment in staying in sport and making them feel comfortable in their own body so they don't drop out of sport. We also have things on menstrual cycle. What is normal? What's not normal? How does that change over from 11 to 18? Mm -hmm. Um, How do we fuel for this growing and maturing body versus how do we fuel when we're already in our 20s, right? Mm -hmm. So it's really highlighting all the changes and the education of why and how do we change things to allow our girls to adapt and stay in sport and feel empowered in their bodies. I love that. Very excited. Very excited about all the information you're putting out. Um, as you just sit back and look at, like we, we started this podcast talking about, um, you know, just how much interest there is now in the things that you've been researching for so long, as you look at the horizon and what's coming up, what makes you most excited about the possibilities for women's health and fitness and performance? Uh, Well, there are two things, really. One, I'm not excited about how messy the conversations have gotten Mm -hmm. because there isn't enough research to actually put a dividing line and say, hey, this is what we see and these Mm -hmm. are the things we need to stop that that isolationist kind of just in sports science. We have six studies that show that there's nothing, right? And we're like, yeah, no. We have to look outside of that. We have to look at the psychosocial aspects because that's super huge. Lived experience, super mm-hmm. huge. We have to look at immunity. We have to look at all those things. So my excitement is the fact that we're now seeing more transdisciplinary research groups. So it's not multidisciplinary where everyone stays in their own little silo and brings them together. Mm-hmm. It's actually the researchers are understanding as a physiologist, I understand what the sociologist is saying, and I'm incorporating Mm -hmm. that into my research. So we're seeing more of that kind of work. So it's Mm -hmm. really exciting to have more of that holistic research coming in. And so the excitement is that coming in, not only into sport, but we're starting to see that more into medical, right? And that is really important because women have been so underserved. I was reading an article uh, the other day about dementia, because I'm really getting into brain health and really mm-hmm. trying to promote that. And one of the risk factors, of course, we see there's a higher incidence in of dementia in women, but they can't find a genetic link. They can't find a dietary link. So now they're like, wait, it's the lived experiences. Because we're looking at the way the brain has been operating in women versus men in this population. And we see that the men were the ones who were going out and having the occupations that made them think more, the engineers, Mm -hmm. the doctors, the lawyers, the women were the ones that were really sitting, not really sitting at home, but were more the taking care of the house and that kind Mm -hmm. of stuff, which wasn't Mm -hmm. as, as mentally taxing and stressful. And I'm saying this from a scientific perspective, not a lived experience perspective. So that we're seeing this now, coming across as that was a risk factor for the onset of dementia. So if we're incorporating lived experiences into medical research, then it's going to be able to understand that and invoke change and say, hey, wait, you know, you were someone who gave up their career to stay home and do all these things to raise your family and take care of the house. Well, now we know that you need to do more puzzles and more neural growth pattern work. So let's really instigate that so that we can stop this risk factor for dementia. So those are all the things that are coming into play that I'm super excited about, of more people working together instead of maintaining this siloed approach. Love that. Love that. Well, this has been lovely. I do want to finish with three questions I ask everyone at the end of the podcast. So the first one is, what are the three things that you do on a regular basis that have the biggest positive impact on your health? Quiet time. Mm. So I get up before anyone else in the house. 
and I have at least 20 minutes of no noise mm. where, you know, I might open the doors and I hear the wind and I might hear the dogs sniffling around in his bed. But other than that, mm. there's no noise. And if I don't have that, then my whole day is very anxious because mm -hmm. there's not a point in time where there isn't any noise. So that's super important. The Love other that. is um, some kind of movement daily. So, you know, you're sitting around, you're doing work, but for me, I'm not designed to sit and stay still. I know that I have to do some kind of movement in order to be creative and be both a good person that works and also a good mom. And then the, mm -hmm. the very last thing that I do to take care of myself and just to give longevity in relationships is I spend minimum of 30 minutes with my daughter every night just chatting asking questions, mm -hmm. being a sounding board, not trying to, to fix solutions or anything. And so it's kind of that bonding time. So those are like the bookend of quiet time for me mm -hmm. and then the bonding time and in the day, just doing things that, that really keep the creative mind going and the body going. I love that. What is, I'm curious, what does the quiet time look like for you? Like, are, does it vary based on the day? Do you like to just sit and soak it in or, or what do you do during those 20 minutes? Well, I'm very, um, very non-changeable. So I get up, sneak downstairs. Mm -hmm. I get my cold brew coffee and I open mm -hmm. the window and I look out at the weather and then I go <laughs> into the living room and I open up the big doors and I can see all of outside and I do my mm -hmm. mobility while I'm having my coffee. Love that. And then I start to hear people wake up and I'm like, okay, now I can deal with the day. Now I'm ready. Yeah. That's beautiful. What is one thing you think would have a big impact on your health, but you have a hard time implementing it? Uh, not being as um, entrepreneurial, hmm. where I have a really hard time saying no. And I'm always looking at what's the next thing, what's the next thing, because of mm -hmm. the curious mind. And I tend to overcommit. And I, yeah, and I need to not be as stressed and as busy all of the time. Mm -hmm. um, because I know that that has a significant impact on sleep and recovery, not physical activity recovery, but just total sure. mental and physical mm -hmm. recovery. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. It's always, always a struggle to find the right balance there because there's always so many, it's a good thing, right? To be so excited about doing so many things and have so many ideas, but yeah. um, finding the right balance is hard. The last question is what does a healthy life look like to you? Mm -hmm. Gosh. Being able to do all the things I want to do mm -hmm. without, you know, fatigue, without injury, without mental stress. So what is that? I don't know. Every day is a little bit different. Maybe it's I want to be able to go for a 100K bike ride and be fit enough to do that and still like have energy for the rest of the day. Or maybe it's um, I want to you know, take my daughter and we go surfing. You know, mm -hmm. there's all those little things. Or maybe it's I have a big block of articles I need to read and write. And I have the mental capacity to understand that and sit there and focus. So yeah, healthy to me isn't like one point in time. It's the whole thing. How are you training for life? So doing all sorts of things to be able to stay mentally and physically capable of doing all the things I want to do. I love that. So beautiful. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for this time. I'm glad you decided to spend some of your precious time with me today and to share all of this knowledge uh, to my audience. So I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you enjoy listening to the podcast, please consider subscribing and giving it a five-star rating on iTunes. It really does help to get the word out to more people.